Zonta International once again presents the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories webinar series, and I welcome you to my conversation with Elsa Marie de Silva. I'm Lynn Foley, and I'm truly privileged to speak with the remarkable women who are so generous with their stories and their time. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also pay that respect to any First Nations people present. Santos International is a leading global organisation working together to build a better world for women and girls. Elsa, it's such a pleasure to have you here today and I warmly welcome you to our conversation. Thank you, Lynn, for having me and I'm so pleased to be speaking with you. And as we begin, I'll just give the audience a very short snippet of an introduction to you because I know we'll reveal the rest of your story as we talk together today. Elsa is the founder of the Red Dot Foundation India and president of the Red Dot Foundation Global USA. And she's created the technology platform Safe City, which crowdsources personal experiences of sexual violence and abuse in public and private spaces globally. And so very shortly, we'll hear much more about Safe City. We'll hear much more about the many, many achievements and awards and um, opportunities that Elsa has had <laughs> and created for herself and others. So I think we might get straight into our conversation today, Elsa. And as I said before, a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, when we first met a little while ago, you indicated that your life and career have unfolded in what you call three stages, and each of them quite different. And it seems to me that it's prepared you for where you are now. I'm really keen to hear where your story began and how your upbringing has influenced your early reflections and then your choice of work. I'd like to think of my life in uh, blocks of 20 years. You know, I just turned 50 a few months back. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first 20 years, of course, you know, you're influenced by your family. You're just trying to find your feet, figure out who you are. And during that time, uh, one thing that I noticed was having a mother who was a working mom was so important because intimate partner violence, which is now a topic that I work on, but it is mm -hmm. part of, uh, you know, many people's everyday life. And it was also part of mine where my father, who is an alcoholic, uh, used to, you know, uh, perpetrate violence on my mom as well as on us and uh, at that point in time you know you you don't understand these words no. there was no name for it there was I mean domestic violence is a recent term intimate partner violence is a recent term but at that point in time you know you never really spoke about it you didn't talk about it outside of your family and but it was my mother who created a stable life for my siblings and myself I have a younger sister and a brother and uh, whilst we were growing up in um, school and in college she provided for us and for me that was a lesson that financial independence was absolutely critical for a woman to have options in her life so the next 20 years of my life was becoming financially independent and I worked really hard I joined an airline as a flight attendant so over a 20 year period I worked for two of India's largest airlines I started off at the bottom of the ladder as a flight attendant but over several years every five years I had a promotion I was always identified for my promotion I never really applied for it and that also says a lot about the need for sponsors to recognize talent, the need for sponsors to give women a chance, because I was always selected for the next role. So I was a safety instructor teaching pilots and cabin crew safety procedures. And then I ended up in strategy and revenue management on a fast track. And my last portfolio was vice president network planning, where I um optimized 500 daily flights for my airline kingfisher airlines and another thing is i really worked very hard all these years and all these various roles have prepared me for the work that i currently do with my nonprofit i feel again you know from my own journey women are taught to um 
you know, taught to um, not take many risks in their life. And so what I've learned in my corporate career was to take more risks, calculated risks, of course, but push yourself forward. And even though I didn't, like I said, I was identified for my next promotion, I was still open to taking that role, even though I didn't know anything about it. I, I worked really hard. I uh, always backed it up with... Uh, um, an education later, so a certification or a diploma or whatever. I even did my MBA parallelly to whilst I was working because the role that I was occupying required as a minimum uh, qualification an MBA. So, you know, women, in my opinion, really work very hard. Uh, they they always want to be 110% sure that they know their work, but a man may have 70% of the knowledge and still confidently step up. So now <laughs> when I mentor young women, I always tell them it's okay. You don't have to have all the answers. Rocket science, there's nothing like <laughs> rocket science except rocket science. So you can <laughs> do whatever you want to do, compensate it with common sense and hard work. Mm, it's it's an interesting um, view, isn't it? To think of it that, um, you can always be what you want to be, but women feel they have to have done the job before they do it. You know, it's almost like, well, I can't do that. I haven't done it before. Well, no, you're about to be promoted. Mm -hmm. So you won't have done the job before. So, And you're right about men want will go forward to a job on 50, 60, 70% um, potential to do it. So it's a really interesting part of a woman's DNA, I think, that um, we work with them on. What do you think it was about your upbringing and yourself and who you are as a young woman that um, I, I don't know whether it was prepared you for or put you in a position to get those promotions that you um, fairly quickly did in your career in Kingfisher Airlines. I'm really interested to hear what you think it was about you that helped others identify you as that leader, the person that would go to the next level and the next level. In my opinion, it's about integrity. It's about uh, hard work. There are no free lunches in life. You have to put in the hard work and the dependability because, you know, for me, and that's linked in my opinion to integrity because my bosses or the people who gave me those opportunities were sure that I could deliver, right? Because they gave me... Um, responsibilities way beyond what I was currently doing. So it wasn't an incremental responsibility addition. It was like a completely new role in many cases. And I believe it was because I demonstrated consistently over a period of time that I had integrity. I was willing to put in the hard work. I was open and flexible, willing mm. to learn. And yet, you know, I um, had the potential. I mean, mm. uh, honestly, how do you determine if somebody has the potential, even if they have all the talent in the world, but they have bad work ethics, you're not mm. going to trust them, right? I, I think it's an overall package that uh, mm. shows through and it's a long-term game, which is again, something that I always uh, tell young people do not take a short-term view of life it's your life's the body of your life's work that will ultimately speak for yourself and bring you the connects bring you the credibility and also maybe in the future like now when I'm in the non-profit world the money because people trust you to do the right thing mm. and uh, we'll come to that in a moment about how challenging it can be to attract the money in the not-for-profit not -for -profit world to do the work that is so important to do. Can I draw you on your ideas about mentoring and sponsorship of women and the importance of it? So you spoke a moment ago about women needing to learn to take more risks, um, calculated risks, preferably, but risks in their work and careers. What, what are your reflections on the power of mentoring and sponsorship of women? 
It's absolutely critical. If you're talking about women's empowerment, I think this is a piece that needs to be intentional and mm -hmm. a lot more investment is needed, um, both for male and female mentors and sponsors. In my case, we didn't have too many women in leadership positions in the airline. The airline has a lot of women or used to have a lot of women at the lower levels of management, mm -hmm. but not or in the front line, but not necessarily on the top. So a lot of male uh, managers and supervisors were my sponsors and people that I had not directly worked with either, you know, but they were watching me <laughs> from afar. Um, Therefore, I think it should be part of every organization's plan for uh, personal development of their team members. And this is something that we take very seriously at my organization, Red Dot Foundation. Personally, I mentor at least 10 young people, especially women, uh, whether they are entrepreneurs or young women, activists, advocates, uh, to uh, be, you know, uh, I won't say stronger leaders, but um, fully rounded leaders, you know, where you can be comfortable showing up in your true unique self. All of us have our strengths, but we are always taught to think about our weaknesses and how can you correct your weaknesses? Only recently, I myself went through a 360 degree feedback as part of an international women's leadership program. Mm. And in addition to the three, 360 degree feedback, we also did a strengths finders assessment. Mm. And for the first time I was told, these are your strengths, play to your strengths, own it. These are the things that you're not necessarily good at. Don't even bother trying to work on it. Surround yourself with people who have those as their strengths. Mm. You know, but all my life, you know, the... The thing is, okay, what are your weaknesses? How can you change them? How can you yeah. correct them? And you spend so much of your, you know, mental space just uh, thinking about it. But once I was told, these are my strengths, play to it. It changed everything for me because now I was confident. I know what I'm really good at. It's not um, you know, down to luck or coincidence, which often I used to put it down to. And honestly, it just made me feel more empowered. And I have a very decentralized leadership style. So it wasn't difficult for me to say, okay, I now know what I'm not really good at and it's confirmed mm -hmm. on paper. So this is what I need to look <laughs> at in my team and surround myself with people like that. And sometimes it's about our preferences too. We could become good at those things we don't prefer in our psychological makeup. But as you say, um, sometimes life causes us to focus on the that side, doesn't it? Life causes us to focus on our weaknesses and we've got to get better at this and do more of this and more of that. And I, I agree with uh, your strengths finder. Once we find our strengths and we own them, then use them and fill the gap. And because mm -hmm. you are now leader of an organisation, which I'm about to move into with you, uh, then you have the opportunity to do that, don't you? To make sure, well, I need people who are this or people who are that. It doesn't mean that you and I don't have to do some of those things we don't like doing, but we don't always have to be best in the world. And it's really interesting. And, and often we spend a lot of time because if you're not good at it, something that would take somebody else five minutes takes us maybe 15 minutes or 25 or 50 minutes. Maybe it's just okay to let go and say you're not good at it and have somebody else do it and That's not right, feel I bad work, about it. I work in my own business and when I left corporate life where I had people doing everything and I started my own business on my own, which I still work mainly on my own like with my partner, it's like, oh, I used to have someone who did that. Oh, I used to have someone who did that. And it's very frustrating and then you have to go and find someone who will help you. It, it's 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 a, a really important learning about your strengths. So all of your work in aviation in that first, in that what second 20 years has prepared you for your third 20 years, which you <laughs> only not long ago entered. Um, and the Red Dot Foundation is where you are. So there are particular uh, times or events that caused you to leave aviation. 
I remember you telling me, and then others that caused you to go and start the work you're doing that you now um, are very focused on through your foundation and the Safe City Project, which we'll come to. Can you talk about how that pathway happened out of aviation and into the not-for-profit world? Absolutely. 2012 was a landmark year for me. You know, sometimes they say things happen to you and mm -hmm. it, when it rains, it pours. So 2012 started off with my airline uh, going through a financial downturn. And by the end of that year, it had shut shop. Mm -hmm. And um, it was also a time in my life when I was looking for my purpose. I'd already reached what I felt at that time was my glass ceiling. I was vice president network planning. You know, exciting work, but I couldn't see myself growing beyond that in any other airline as well in India. And um, I, I couldn't see myself in any other, you know, feel like banking or something else. So I was looking at, okay, what what's next? And so I most fortunately happened to be selected into a program by the Swedish Institute. The Swedish Institute is the cultural arm of Sweden, and they focus on uh, leadership programs on CSR, corporate social responsibility and sustainability in business. These were terms that I wasn't familiar with. We did not even have a department in our organization at that time. And so it was fascinating for me. And mind you, at the same time, my airline was going through this Yes. <laughs> financial downturn. So for me, it was like, you know, um, we are not, I mean, not personally me, but as an organization, we are not living these values that are so important. And it was so fascinating to learn about all these areas. Uh, had the airline survived, I probably would have pitched to lead that mm -hmm. department. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. But as part of that program, one had to do a project in one's company. And my project was focused on helping women achieve their potential. And for some reason, in the final module in Sweden in December, they introduced me to Harass Map Egypt, which was a similar project to Safe City, where they were crowd mapping sexual violence in public spaces. And I thought, oh, that's such a cool idea, but maybe it's not urgent in India. And how wrong I was, because on returning from Sweden, within a week or so, there was this horrific incident of Jyoti Singh, where she and her, she and her male uh, colleague or partner were traveling in a bus after watching a movie and they got assaulted by a group of young men on a public bus and Jyoti was gang raped multiple times and then left to die on the streets in Delhi. Now that incident was very shocking in its brutality. It made national news, international news. I remember for the first time, everyone was just talking about this incident. And you would open the newspaper, that was the story. You would put on the TV, that was the story. You would go to any public or private gathering, that was the story. And so it forced you to think of your own um, you know, stance on the issue, but also it triggered many memories where I remembered being harassed on a bus, groped on a train, being catcalled on the streets, even sexually harassed at work. With all these memories I had suppressed, I had not spoken about, I had not made any official complaints. And similarly, my friends had similar incidents and all of us started sharing with each other and in addition to having common experiences, one thing was also common that none of us had spoken about it until then. And that made me think that, you know, maybe I should focus on this as an issue rather than helping women achieve their career potential as a project. And so that's how Safe City was born. Literally 10 days after the gang rape of Jyoti Singh, we felt an immediate need to respond to that gang rape. And do something concrete. So as friends of mine and um, myself, we launched this platform, Safe City, where we invited people to share their personal stories of sexual and gender-based violence, 
It would then be collated as location-based trends, visualized on a map, mm -hmm. and made visible so that everyone could see the scope and extent of what was happening. And it was amazing because stories started pouring in from all over India and also outside of India, and it got a lot of media attention. And so for the next one year, 2013, whilst I was still figuring out what I wanted to do work-wise, mm -hmm. this thing occupied my mind and my time. Mm -hmm. And I decided, okay, what after the stories come in? What can we do further? And that's when I decided to work with another organization and see how we could mobilize communities on the ground and see who we could engage to make that change happen. And that's how, you know, we started with this methodology of complementing what was logged online with translating it to community-based action where solutions came from the community after they understood what their, um, you know, fellow residents or fellow um citizens were experiencing and it was so powerful because the power of data coupled with the power of the community is absolutely um you know fascinating to watch when you can get police to change beat patrol timings civic authorities mm -hmm. to fix broken infrastructure and just mm -hmm. uh citizens themselves deciding that this was no longer acceptable so are you therefore finding with the Safe City Project in all the areas that you speak of is continuing more and more and more to get uh, even local authorities and government to think differently about how to make their city safer? Is that is that the power yes. you're seeing coming? Okay. Yes. So now since then, we have registered two nonprofits, one in India and one in the USA that supports our work outside of India. The app is in its third iteration. It's available mm -hmm. uh, on the web and mm -hmm. on Android phones and iOS, Apple phones. It's available in 12 languages. Ukrainian mm -hmm. and Serbian are our latest languages. We have country oh, wow. chapters in 17 countries mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the Philippines, Malaysia, to Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. Kenya, Nigeria, Cameroon in Africa. We also have Netherlands, Croatia, and Romania in Europe. So we have a wide range of uh, different countries participating in this program. Our partners are mainly nonprofits or community-based organizations or feminist collectives that have been working on women empowerment, but maybe focused on different aspects of it, like maybe women's health or children's education. So we are like a very complementary partner. But they use the data in ways that make sense to their community and ask their community to suggest solutions that uh, would work for them. So, for example, in Kenya, they've engaged religious leaders to talk to men and boys. In the Philippines, they are working with the mayor and local government uh, officials to better respond to survivors with official resources. So, so um, I'll, just, I'll just take a little bit of a, a detour for a moment in our conversation that the Safe City Project, as you see it, has, from my um, thinking, some real synergy with, uh, we're in November, of course, and... Um, November sees the 16 days of activism around domestic and family violence. So there's some real synergy between your work and all of the um, action and advocacy and um, activity that, let's say, all the Zolta clubs around the world engage in all year round, but particularly during those 16 days of activism. Um, do, you, do you see that um, as an alignment and perhaps um, people who are, who listen and watch to us watch sorry watch us today um may wish to engage with the safe city project how might that happen so can you talk us through that i would like to invite the zonta international community to use the safe city application it's very simple safecity.in and we can put the link in the chat section or the description section mm -hmm. 
why don't you try it? You can report any kind of sexual and gender-based violence for yourself or if you witnessed it. And it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be in the moment. We are not an SOS app. You can report as far back as you want. The mm -hmm. idea is to document it because if you didn't document it, in effect, there's no record of it happening. Now, what are we asking you to record? What happened to you? So a description, some mm -hmm. people write one word harass, some people write a whole essay and that's okay mm -hmm. because it's part of the healing process in my view. A category to match the description. Mm -hmm. So you can pick one or more categories and we mm -hmm. have broken it down to cover the range of sexual and gender-based violence. This is important because many people often club all the forms of gender-based violence into one kind. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's different forms of it. Mm -hmm. And now that we live in a technology-driven world, there's also the digital violence. Mm -hmm. So you can pick as many categories that match your experience. The date or an approximation, the time of day and an approximation. And then if you want to say whether you report it to the police and then uh, put the location of it right up to the street level. We don't ask you for your name. We don't ask you for any personal information. Mm -hmm. After this, you have the choice to end the report or to continue and take a further survey, which will help us understand better the correlation and the causation mm -hmm. of the factors that cause this violence. But if you choose to end it there, based on where you are, we will try to send you help information based on your country. So the legal information. Suppose if you you picked India and stalking, you will get the Indian Penal Code for stalking, the prompts to uh, you know call a helpline number, a prompt to go to the police station, the nearest police station, etc. The idea is to push this information to you so that if you choose to make any uh, further um, action to report it in the formal system, you have all the information that you need to go and record it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you choose not to, then you can also look at the map and see what other people have reported. And we mm -hmm. say that if you have substantial amount of reports, about 100 or 500 reports in a particular area, mm -hmm. make a representation with your community to whichever stakeholder you think mm -hmm. might be able to make that change. Often in many countries like mine, you don't have data that is recorded mm -hmm. in a police station easily available, mm -hmm. but safe city data is available to you. And you can use that to ask the police to change beat patrol timings or fix, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get the civic authorities to fix broken infrastructure. A lot mm -hmm. of people think lighting is the problem. I mm -hmm. want to emphasize that often having data collected in a structured manner like us helps you understand the problem better. So for example, what is the peak when these incidents occur? Take a guess. It's between noon and 2 p.m. Is lighting an issue in a country that is sunny year round? No. So we have to start broadening our mind and holding people accountable so that they can create spaces that are safer for us, right? Mm -hmm. You can also use it to make a case for better education or better mental health resources mm -hmm. or better survivor facilities, but it's all up to you. And data gives you the power to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the power here is with the individual or the group of people and the people, the women themselves, and hopefully the men around them to cause, and this crowdsourcing is important, isn't it? It's from the ground up. So hopefully what you what I presume you're looking for is from the ground up, we get some change around the way in which people view all forms of violence and do something about it to make our but cities also, safer. But also the top-down approach because we have been approached by police and mayors to say that they are not getting reports. See, it backfires on us when we don't report. Report. Right? Absolutely. 
And if you have good people in positions of power, they really want to do something good. They want the they want to reduce the violence. But if they don't know, they don't have the data, mm -hmm. how do they deploy the resources? So we actually have been working with several police forces, helping them understand the nature of the violence. None of this mm -hmm. has personal information, but we look at patterns mm -hmm. and trends and mm -hmm. then we try to help them think about, okay, how can your... Uh, police or how can your uh, city officials be better responsive to the needs of the community to give you an example in the philippines in quezon city we are working with the mayor and her uh, city officials they have endorsed the safe city app encouraged their communities to respond so every week they are looking at the map to see what reports are coming up Suppose if there's a case of domestic violence or three, four cases of domestic violence in a particular location, they will invite all the residents of that location to come to the community center for a briefing on domestic violence and the resources available, et cetera. As a result, they've seen a direct increase in the uptake of these uh, resources which mm. otherwise are underutilized so mm. if somebody is in power and they really have good intent they can use this data and work with local community organizations to be more responsive to build more trust in the system and to create safe spaces for dialogue mm. so it's uh, it's a fabulous project you've had many awards personally and and with your organizations and um, the not-for-profit space is challenging at best when you're looking for investors and people to invest in your work so you can continue it. Have you noticed that the awards are assisting you to attract the, 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 the philanthropic um, donations you're looking for or not? And what, what are the barriers that you feel are yet to be overcome for you and your organisation, the Red Dot Foundation? I call the awards shiny baubles, which you need to pull out of your pocket when you need them. But they certainly, you know, afford you some credibility because as a fairly new organization with a fairly innovative way of operating, you know, we don't work on individual cases of domestic violence. We don't operate in a traditional manner. It took a while for people to understand what exactly we were doing and also for us to explain. Remember, I came from the corporate sector. Mm. We didn't, you know, I didn't come from this space. Mm. So, but now people recognize that we are um, innovative. Our data is useful. We've shown how it can be used. Uh, trust and integrity have been uh, proven because in uh, the design of our app, you know, we do not collect any personal information or even IP addresses. So it is protected. We also have an empathy layer in the UI and UX design built in. So a lot of safeguards have been put in place from a privacy and ethics, data ethics point of view. So, and remember when I said in the beginning, to me, integrity and your entire body of work, you know, kind of speaks for you. Uh, at the end of the day. So I think after 10 years, people do take us seriously now. About funding, I think funding is always a challenge for everyone. So we have tried to be innovative even in that space. So some part of our funding comes from working with corporates on DEI, that is diversity, equity, and in inclusion in the workspace. Also creating safe spaces for their employees and preventing sexual harassment. We work with diplomatic missions in Western India to um, you know, give them a lot of visibility, but also they are a partner with us on things like 16 days or International Women's Day. We put together events with them. We also secure grants from them. And then we have other donations um, that come in through regular donors. So, um, I mean, donor agencies. I believe that it's better to work with people who understand you you don't have to change your whole approach to fit in with their agenda. I prefer working with people who, um, you know, want to support you in the long run, not for the short term, not to tick a box, but really to walk with you on that journey, to be intentional about creating safe spaces 
Uh, we work a lot with young people as well, building their leadership to be change agents in their community. Our data shows that 90% of young people, when they experience sexual violence, do not tell an adult or their teacher or professor because they are afraid that their freedoms will be curtailed. They tell a friend who often doesn't know what to do. So mm. we have a program where every year we train like 500 young people as uh, ambassadors. They are peer educators, but they are also trained as first responders in their communities. And these then, you know, forever have that knowledge on how to uh, help their fellow uh, students or fellow young people. And I think that's very important, you know, empowering them with the right knowledge and skills, breaking yes. the taboo around this issue. Mm, absolutely. Can I just take us into the more, um, the broad space of gender equity and the progress the world is making towards it or not? Many uh, women I speak to in Zonta and in my other groups, uh, we have concern about how the gender the, the, the road to gender equity has slowed and stopped in some aspects retreated, it depends. Do you have some views to share with us about what you see happening globally? Because you have a very um, well-positioned voice globally around the matters that you're dealing with. So what do you think about the, pro the pathway to gender equity and what's, what needs to change for us to get closer? Men. Men have to give up space and to share power. Um, and that's why, you know, 60% of our volunteers are young men. And I'm very proud to say that those who go through our programs, <clears throat> I cannot see them as perpetrators or they cannot be silent bystanders. They will forever, you know, want to be agents of change, agents of peace in a way. Um, I think if you want to fast track gender equity and equality, that's where we need to focus on young men. But at the same time, we have to make sure the laws are in place. There are still many countries where laws do not protect the rights of women. Uh, we also have to train women to take more risks, to stand mm -hmm. up for themselves, to not feel afraid to ask for help, to, uh, to make the formal system that is the legal system work for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think Safe City, uh, you know, addresses all of this in many different ways. Mm -hmm. It um, provides safe spaces. If you don't have safe transportation and safe public spaces, how do you expect women to go out, get a career, upskill mm -hmm. themselves, get further education? I remember whilst I was working, I was also doing night college. And mm. if I was not allowed by my family or if it wasn't safe, I would not have that additional degree that may have, you know, gotten me the mm. next promotion. Mm. Um, as part of my job, I have to travel. I had to travel mm. and not make excuses, right? Otherwise, mm. it's not a level playing field. I won't be given the same mm. opportunities as a male. Absolutely. So, and our data has been used in one of the papers as one of the data sets to put an economic cost to sexual harassment for women in Delhi. And mm. it's pegged at about US dollars 250, which is often somebody's monthly salary. So women compromise on their opportunities. They self-censor, they self-limit. And uh, we can't have that happen. And the second thing is that <clears throat> accountability of institutions what is the role of institutions in creating these safe spaces and without the data you can't really hold them accountable so i think our work in a way tries to address it in many different ways on one hand uh, giving people the information that they need to um, be uh, self-sufficient and uh, speak up and break the silence around it. We have data that will advance laws, data that will help in decision making and allocation of resources, as well as holding institutions accountable. And there's so much in amongst all of this for women is fear, is overcoming the fear factors of everything, the fear to take risks, the fear to report, the fear of consequences if they're in um, violent relationships or controlling relationships. And um, it, what we're looking here for is uh, a massive shift in change. I think it's happening. I think we are it's through happening. organizations like yours and many around the world, it is happening. Um, I must admit that I thought I used to think when I was your age, 
that when I got to my age, if we talk about 20 year <laughs> blogs, uh, we would be further ahead. Um, mm. So it'll be interesting to see how the next 20 years takes us forward, I think, Elsa. Can I just I think, quickly? Um, but I, I also sorry. think that, you know, we your generation probably helped break a lot more barriers. And now my generation has to be the role models. Like you have to see her to be her, right? So yes. storytelling and role models and mentors are all very critical. And that's what I find. It's the storytelling. I work with a lot of um, women in your age group, the Generation X women and men. And it is the storytelling. And it's interesting how younger men and women are interested in the storytelling of those of us who yeah, have have um, had a little bit to do with glass ceilings and other things around us. but uh, And it's our job now to work with you to make that happen. That's what I see. I don't think it's only up to you. I think it's for all of us to work together to make it happen. You've published a lot of articles, edited, co-edited, authored books. You have already uh, a strong voice in various parts of the world and on various platforms. Firstly, do you see that as one of those strengths you talk about or not? And secondly, how is that uh, contributing to this whole world of improving uh, gender equity globally and making life safer for women? I definitely think it's a strength. <laughs> and honestly, I love doing it. So it's also something that um, de-stresses me. You know, mm. I love I love talking like this. So I do interviews like this pretty much once a week, I would say. But it's not a stress for me. I love it. I love sharing. Uh, I love sharing my thoughts as well. Uh, of course, I went through a fellowship with Aspen New Voices that really helped me structure op-eds and, uh, you know, structure your thoughts so that they are coherent and resonant to a wider audience. And... Um, I believe it's a privilege that I've been afforded that I am in a time and space where I can do it. So I, I think everybody must use their platform to raise and amplify issues that they are passionate about to um, make it easier for whoever that needs it to be easier for, mm -hmm. reach behind and pull other people up as we go along uh, the way of progress mm -hmm. so I'm doing as much as I can and I um, I would love to do more <laughs> yeah what else what other strengths do you think you know we talked you talked earlier about uh, the program and finding your strengths and owning them what other areas do you think are your strengths or your gifts particularly in the leadership space what are they you've got gifts but now you've identified your strengths so what are they and other than the one you've just spoken of and how do you use them, do you think? So my strengths are really finding the opportunities and finding the people and matching people to people and people to opportunities and helping them make the most out of that. So I'm able to spot unique skills and talents. Like they don't even have to be unique, but I just, in, I just know what somebody is good at and who they might benefit from if I connected them with somebody else mm -hmm. and I often do it and forget about it and then later you know somebody will say oh do you remember you were the one who connected me to this opportunity and look where it's gotten me and I was like really I I you know I don't even remember it but whenever I'm meeting someone my brain is constantly trying to figure out okay how can I help this person even if they're not mm -hmm. asking me for help I'm like mm -hmm. okay how can I, like, who can I connect them to or what might help them in my mm. sphere of influence? And I feel that is my strength. Um, and one of my mentors told me, give, give, give with no, no expectation of getting, but you will receive in abundance. And I truly mm. believe that is my life because I live, I mean, I, I'm very, very happy right now. And I cannot even describe how blessed my life is. You know, so I, yeah, so I guess it's because of that. It's, it's, a, it's a great place to be in because that must give you the power and the lift to um, mm. do the work you do because, in fact, you're immersed in other people's issues in a way. You know, you must, when you look at your data, you must sometimes 
find that um, interesting and challenging because you look at the data and you think, oh, so many women are not safe. So many women are struggling with um, how they will break through some of those really unsafe situations. Can you talk to me a little bit as we get closer to wrapping up today's conversation, which is fabulous, how you go about facing some of the challenges in life? So undoubtedly, you don't get through your, what are we, in your third 20-year space without some challenges. So how do you face them? What do you reach out to when things aren't going as well as you'd like, either personally or professionally? Well, I've reached a stage where I am shameless in asking for help. So <laughs> if something is not working out, you know, I go back to the drawing board. I go back to my board. I ask my friends and I'm like, okay, what's, you know, I need help. You know, what's happening over here? Um, I I do believe that, you know, you have to take care of yourself. So I'm very, very conscious of self-care. I, I am human. So whilst I try to do a lot, there are days when um, things don't go my way or I'm tired. So I take a break. I watch a lot of Netflix. Then I binge watch <laughs> Netflix, not just watch yes. Netflix. And um, I love massages, you know. So I think do whatever makes you feel happy. Uh, I have several friends and I love a glass of wine with them. So um, I'm trying to do more of that in my life, create more time for myself, with my family, with my friends, with people I love, uh, focus on things that I care about and cut out all the noise in my life so that, um, you know, there's less toxicity. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's what I do. So if somebody's if somebody is not, uh, is, you know, is like constantly headbutting you. Um, and if that person is in your organization, of course, you have to find a way out and, you know, find, find out what's the issue. So we <coughs> spend a lot of time on that person, uh, either finding them the help mm -hmm. or figuring out what in our process is causing the issue. So don't mm -hmm. make it personal. But otherwise, cut out the toxicity as quickly as you can so that you can just focus on the work and the mission. I agree with that. And so often women um, take on so many things and we carry a mental and a physical load for ourselves and others. And it's reminding ourselves that that's not our role. We're not put here mm -hmm. in life to do that. As if, For those of us who are parents, we uh, do that, of course, uh, when we're parents and we have little people around us that eventually we have to let go of that mental load as well and remember that um, everyone's got their own life to live. So you've got a powerful story. Um, you've had many successes so far. I'm wondering what's next. What's next for you? <laughs> and, and how might you use that big voice of yours, that voice that you've develop that people are listening to because clearly people are listening I know that today you're in Germany I'm here in Brisbane in uh, Australia and um, you're making a global difference and connecting all over the space you know in the Commission of Status for Women all of the really powerful platforms you get a voice so what's next you know I I think I have to do more of what I'm doing at a faster rate because I do want to end violence against women and girls in my lifetime. So if that, I can't wait 150 years or I don't no. think it's fair to wait 150 years or 200 years or even 50 years. So the I'm just trying to use every means that I can to raise this issue, to make people understand it and to further break the taboo around it so that it's no longer you know a problem to even ask for help or report and I do and want to say that whilst I grew up in a very um, you know turbulent uh, family life I think whatever said and done my family still is my bedrock you know even my mm -hmm. father he's very liberal he was never um, he never discriminated against me because I was a woman, you know, he just was an alcoholic. But I think over, over the years, he has been my biggest supporter as well as my mother and my siblings. Mm. And 
we all need these strong structures that support us so if i can be that structure for somebody else who's going through a crisis but also create more structures through my organizations through the coalitions through partnerships like you know with zonta international or through the un ecosoc um committees mm -hmm. and all that i think we need more of that you know and we cannot mm -hmm. stop we cannot let our let our guards down so that's what i will do and i continue to do and more voices the more voices we have yes. as men and yes. women around the issue of violence against women but it's also about how where that fits in the path to gender equity and we know the World Economic Forum says that it's around 100 years for that to be achieved globally. And you're right, we can't wait. Even the children being born today can't wait 100 years. They need to come into a world. Um, both the boys and girls being born today need to come into a world that's safer and um, freer and not having to break glass ceilings and all of the other ways in which we describe um, where we've come or where we're attempting to go to in gender. Elsa, what a powerful conversation um, you've had with me today. It's, it's, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to meet you in this way and to hear your story, but to also hear about the fabulous work you're doing uh, globally through the Red Dot Foundation, your Safe City project, and all of the other ways in which you touch the lives of other, other women and girls in our world. So I thank you for that. Zonta International thanks you for that because there's so much alignment and parallel between your work and the work that Zonta throughout the world is working towards. And in this period of the 16 days of activism, um, it's even more important and more synergistic that we're speaking today. So thank you so much. And do you have a final word for the people watching and, and listening today? Thank you, Lynn, for having me. And I want to remind everyone that, you know, we are speaking during 16 days of activism. It's a shame that you have to have a campaign every year to remind us that there is 16 days uh, that we are spotlighting violence against women and girls. Let's make it our duty to end it in our communities, in our families, in our organizations. And if each of us did our bit, then the world would be a much safer place and wouldn't we all be very happy? So let's start by reporting it, documenting it and Safe City is a free platform, use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elsa. And I wish you well in the next steps that you take. Thank you. Zonta International, uh, this will be our last webinar for 2023. And I look forward to seeing you all again uh, very early in January in 2024 with our next guest and the guests that will follow in 2024. And I thank you for your loyalty to this series of webinars about remarkable women with very powerful stories.